Wayman and Boone, thank you for joining us at Something Came From Baltimore. Something came from Baltimore. <laughs> Very happy to be here. Great. Hey, uh, we talked about Splenda as a, your band. Um, looking back on it, now you're about 15 years into it. Do you feel that you would have lasted longer if you guys communicated better? Or where was the, where was the break? Uh, I think the break usually comes like anything. It, it, we, we were we were together for a long time. I mean, even if the world, because what was interesting about that band, it's like it was either a band that no one had heard of, and or the people that did seemed to worship it. And but we had been together for almost 14 years, so I feel like nothing really would have changed it other than we just needed to do different things. We knew each other more than we we were like married to each other for quite a while. So I, I think it ran its course. We were, we, we kind of did it for a long time and then just said, it's time to throw in a towel. You know, your music is not really added on to like the hits of the 90s uh, as a reminder to, you know, the audience as to what your, how great the band was. How does that happen when you've had like three major hits that it doesn't... It's, you know, I guess something like that depends, really. It depends on who you ask. I, I, to this day, I'll still get people that are in the supermarket or in a pharmacy, and they say, hey, your song is on the radio. I really like, you know, Splendor music. And and then some other people, again, they were like, oh, I've never heard of you guys. But it, it, it kind of fell somewhere in between. I mean, as far as the dream is concerned, I feel like I was able to get everything I ever dreamed of in one place. And and so I, I I think part of that too is like it just depends on the time. Sometimes I mean for us we we I suppose because we came out at the very very end the very last few months of the '90s it made us less of a '90s nostalgic band because the record was really out in the the 2000s. So it, it kind of fell between that moniker I guess. Now um, it's also your decline of your band was kind of the decline of modern rock radio. So the, the, it wasn't really a format that your music would really just fall into really easily. Right. Yeah, I mean, time, look, times change. Uh, unfortunately, I think the band itself, we didn't have much gusto to want to change with it, which a lot of artists can happily do. We, we just needed to go different ways after, after we, 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 we thought it wasn't necessary for us to go into two full decades together. <laughs> yeah, that's understandable. Now, I, I'm not, I'm gonna stop talking about Splendor soon, but I got some more questions. Uh, it's a it's a major coup to have Todd Rundgren as a producer and also a first, on your first album. But uh, feedback from Patti Smith from Wave, uh, from Meatloaf from Bad Out of Hell, and XTC from Skylarking is that he was one tough cookie to work with. Uh, was he that way with you guys? He was that way and worse. Uh, the way that that came to be at the time was, you know, we signed with, with Columbia Records at the time, the biggest label in the world, and our A&R guy, uh, his name was J is James Diener, and James uh, did well. He went on to become the head of A&M Records and signed Rune 5 and a series of numbers. I just, my, my all-time life mentor, someone to this day, I have, no, I have nothing but respect for him. And he was the one that originally suggested it because there were a lot of producers of the moment at the time that were hot coming off of big records. And he just said, you really need to check out Todd. I mean, this guy is a legend. And the interesting part was my publishing company, my management company, and the, sort of my handlers and people around me just started sending me all of these articles. And it was article after article on all the negative repercussions of working with Todd was all these bands that basically talked a lot of crap. And I found that interesting because just last night there's a brand new documentary, I think it was on HBO, on XTC. Yeah, I yeah. Mm -hmm. all, it was fantastic. And so, of course, I watched very tentatively of, attentive of what happened during the Skylarking days because that was really the record. The XTC record, Skylarking, is what made us say, okay, we really need to work with this guy. And I think that the biggest problem of working with him that, that you know, we were young and we were rebellious and just and nervous and wanted to make a great record 
But I see that from watching the XTC last night, it was the exact same problem. When you go into the studio and you try to do overdubs and you're trying to just sort of find your way, and you work with someone that's done so many albums, to one of you it's like the most important pearl in the world, and to the other it's just another day in the office. So to, to, to him, the idea of doing overdubs and spending more time to develop sounds and figure out things was not how he worked. He just sort of wanted everything to be one or two takes and move on, one or two takes and move on. And while that's respectable, and while that's certainly there are certainly many acts that that's how they do it, it wasn't, you, sometimes you have to tailor to the artist you work with, and that's just not how we were prepared to operate. We had this giant machine of a label on our backs. People were anticipating the record. We didn't know, you know, and any our asses from our elbows, and we needed some time to figure stuff out. Plus, we isolated ourselves because we, we left, we, the band's from New York, we left New York, we ended up going to upstate New York, going to his studio, the same studio that I watched last night for, for Skylarking, and it's a very isolated, it's almost like being on a farm in the middle of nowhere, so the label is not there, there's no distractions, which is, which is cool, but it also meant that we were falling under his ruling a lot more than the average band, because sometimes labels come in and they disrupt the flow of things, and I realized part of this we kind of needed to disrupt it. And then we also had a bunch of weird stuff happen all the time because Todd has this interesting relationship with his fans. He basically hates them. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and he show, and it's kind of his thing. It's like, you know, I know that sometimes you can go to one of those dinner theaters where all the wait staff just kind of insult you and that's why you go there, like a Don Rickles kind of thing. And, and he... In his own way, it's like he disses his fans very hard and he treats them with very little respect in a way that they seem to love even more. So we used to have all these strange hippies and weirdos that would just meander into the studio and sit around and he would just kind of insult them and leave. Because I do remember that apparently a decade before that he had been robbed, Mm -hmm. I guess, at, at that studio. Someone at gunpoint, I think they tied him up and they took all of his stuff and so I mean I, I'm sure there was a certain paranoid thing to, if, if something like that happens on your home turf but it made it a very strange isolated way to be and the only person we could look up to was Todd and he took advantage of that concept because he wasn't really the kindest the friendliest of, of people when it came to just working on music hey what do you think it was like next you get up to do a vocal you know in today's music if you're going to sing a song is even though in music videos it looks like a singer sings in one take, the reality is it could be take after take after take, and comping this one and that one, and you could do it on different days. I, I remember one of my mentors was a guy named Mike Shipley, who, who has since passed, and Mike Shipley's a really big mixer and producer, and he did everyone from Def Leppard to Green Day to 30, days, 30 Seconds to Mars, and and his, he was telling me a funny story about working with Mutt Lang and talking about how... Um, uh, Elliot from Def Leppard took 30 days to just do the vocal on Love Bites. You know, and you go, wow, 30 days? That seems insane. That's almost like a syllable a day. <laughs> that seems a little foreign. But in our case, we, you know, that was one extreme. The other extreme for us was like just sing it in one take and then move on. Whether you were flat, whether you were short, it didn't matter. Sometimes I missed up the words. At one point, we were having such a tumultuous relationship that I didn't sing the second verse, and he thought it sounded great. <laughs> it, was a, it was a tough time. It was definitely a tough time and something new. But at the same time, it gave us a lot of credibility, I suppose, and critics listened to it in a different way because it had Todd's touch on it. And 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 I did my best. I, I, I look at myself as being a very calm individual but he's the only person that i can remember trying to actually physically fight where we were chasing each other or i i should say i was chasing him around the mixing board of one day when i was just trying to get my hands on his throat to kill him you know uh xdc and is filled with overdubs and and your band also is is very layered with their their uh performances it's I maybe wasn't a good fit. Although Scarlarkin came out was a great album, and what he did with you guys was a great album, also. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's that yeah. tension that maybe helps in some ways. But who wants to live that way? Well, that's that's the thing. I, I kind of looked at it as life's a little bit too short to have that much to 
have that many problems. One fun thing that he forced us to do was, well, basically, to answer your question, what we had to do is we had to do all of our overdubs when he wasn't there. So we would have to either, he had a very, I never worked with anyone, like, he had a very regimented schedule where we would record our record from noon to 6 p.m. every day. And any musician in the world that's ever been in the studio would laugh hearing something like that because there are no hours, really. And the concept of only, it was even less than doing a nine-to-five job. So he would come in every day at 11.45, he would make his tea, he would place it on the mixing board, then he would lean back, put his two feet up on the board, and we would start at noon. And at the time, he had this very Abbey Road kind of setup where the mixing console was higher up, and it and it looked down on us in this kind of gymnasium. If you kind of picture the band playing in a circle in the gymnasium, and at that point, we were so well rehearsed that we pretty much did everything. All the basic tracks were all done live, and just we all played together in one take. And, <laughs> and all we would do is we would stand in that circle, and he would lean over and say, okay, let's start. And then we'd play a song, and then we'd end, and all we would see were just two feet up on the console. And he, he explained to us before we, before we started how he had, like, ADD, and he had to, he would read magazines and type on computers, but try to explain to us that's just how his brain worked, that he really wasn't ignoring us, although I would, I would argue something like that. So, he, so we would watch him, and he would put his feet up on the board, he would turn pages in a magazine, and then the song would end, We'd stand in silence, and then we'd say, how was that? And then he'd lean forward, press the button, and says, how was that to you? And we'd say, pretty good. And then he'd say, okay, let's move on. Wow. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's well, tough what, for your first what album. What it ended up doing was, it, I guess, some of, the fe- some of the fear was bad, and some of the fear and tension was good. One, one fun thing that he would force us to do is that when we did have to do overdubs, both myself being the guitar player, I was the lead singer and the guitar player, and the other guitar player, Jonathan, we would have to each stand, you know, in, in these studios, big giant speakers. So we have to each stand on each side of the studio in front of our respected, uh, respective speaker. And he'd play the song, and he would just look at us and say, you get one take. So our overdubs would sometimes just be the two of us looking at each other, just playing the song from beginning to end, praying to God we never made a mistake. To <laughs> to record and when you know I listen to the record now I think Jesus that's that, some of that is kind of impressive a lot of bands would never do that now you don't need to and we weren't using Pro Tools even though Pro Tools was out and everybody used Pro Tools he just refused to mm-hmm. yeah you don't even have to be in the same room anymore or in the same city and record no albums. no not even not even the same town you know um, your writing is fantastic along with your singing but. Um, do you ever feel that you have the urge to just break out and do another album, or are you writing? Do you have any time to do that? I well, my time is very limited nowadays, and 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 part of it is I kind of I kind of try to shift my energy from I, you know I never imagined a day in my life I spent twenty years of my life doing only music for, I don't know for, forever in a day, so it was very tough when I had to make the decision to switch careers. So I do play music every now and then, but not as much. There's certainly a higher demand of people constantly asking me to write with them or write for them or produce for them or work with them. But I just, at this stage in my life, I just don't have the time to do it. I, or at least I can't make the time yet. I, I feel like if the right artist came along, I was just talking to the other day to one of my friends about this, Like if the right artist came along, I would... I might find I might try to find the time to just do an album with one artist, whether whatever that one artist was. Mm-hmm. But that to me has been one of the harder parts for me to accept is to say, okay, well, how how much love do I still have for music, which is still is never going to go away, but it's really time management more than anything. You know, there's very few artists that can get away with a line from. You cradle the flies in the back of your mouth, and yeah, whatever. Like that's a really cool line, and you don't get that in top forty songs anymore or ever. Um, <laughs> when I hear that's that, true. the imagery of that song is so strong, and uh, it's such a good diss song. And I don't know, uh, I just love to hear it. I just uh, I was listening to it, and they took the um, f word out and put 
uh, you know, and then took that away, and it kind of ruined the fun of the song. I was a little little bummed out. Yeah, well, they always they always have some version, a clean version of it, and I think that you know at the at the time. I, I wish I didn't have to do it that way. That's the only part about music that I didn't like. I always felt I have to, I had to suffer for my art. Yet, you know, I was in a relationship and I got dumped, and I, she, she pretty much ruined my life as far as I was concerned for that one moment of time. And the greatest thing happened from it because I'd spent so many years trying. You know, every musician, all you want to do is get a record deal, get a record deal, get a record deal, and so. One one day, I just show, was writing these songs, and I showed up at her apartment, and she was like, it's over, it's over, I'm done, get out. <laughs> and and I, I decided at that moment in time that I was going to give up everything to just dedicate myself to music, which I had already been doing, but that also meant my job and any income and anything. And at the time, the band had a rehearsal space. Is this I'm shit still there on 8th Avenue and 42nd Street, a big rehearsal space there that's has hundreds of bands in it, and I moved into our rehearsal room, and I just wrote all of these songs about her wrecking my world and ruining my life and trying to trying to get kind of payback, because I find myself, I can get more vengeance back in songs than I can in real life. I don't, I, I guess in real life, I don't have much of a temper, but I can put lots of temper when it comes to creative stuff. So I just moved into the rehearsal room, and the best story, I mean, it sounds like it's made up, but it really isn't. I stayed in this rehearsal space on and off for about nine months, and I didn't have a job, I had no income, I had no money, I barely had any time, any way to eat. And I came home, and I had an eviction notice on my apartment. This is when I was living in, in Astoria, Queens at the time. And the phone was shut off, everything was done, but I did manage to get one last knock at the door, which was a friend of mine coming and say, hey, they're trying to get in touch with you because Columbia Records is interested now in signing your band. And it was just a great, you know, it was like winning the lottery, really. Uh, every, it's every musician's dream. Say, hey, call me a record, wants to sign you and put a record out. It was just the greatest moment ever. But I do remember how how I thought, and I, maybe it trained me in a, in a bad way, where it's like, oh, I see, so I'm being rewarded for all of this, <laughs> all of this suffering. And I've had to shake that for years since, to say, no, 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 you can be rewarded without having to only be in the dirt. But I always did feel like when we would do some of these alternative rocks and pop songs, I would take some chances with lyrics and not use just the traditional one and hopefully get away with it. And I seem to be able to. You know, you were a rarity. Uh, you're a black guy in the front of a, of a rock modern band. You know, you toured around. Um, did you find there any kind of racism at that point? I mean, we're talking 15 years ago. Uh, modern, yeah, rock, you know, I... modern rock seemed to have just kind of a, a whites-only group, and it was very rare that... <laughs> yeah, living color, and they acted like it was the end of the world. That's why I was kind of that, curious. That is true. I mean, between it felt like there was living color, there was Hootie, there was Lenny Kravitz, and there was us. And I, I guess I didn't really find um, any form of racism when it had to do with the music itself. Because one thing that one thing I was very lucky to do, which is I, it just doesn't happen anymore. But at the time, before I ever got a record deal, I got a publishing deal. And for people that don't know what publishing is, is ba basically someone that manages your music. A manager can manage the band, but the publisher manages your songs. And so they took us on, and they just thought the group was great, and we're like, hey, we're going to get you there, we're going to get you a record deal, you guys are going to be able to, you're going to make it, you're going to make it. And so uh, the company was called Hit and Run, and the main owner was Phil Collins, and his, his team kind of took us on. And they took us around the world, which is something very, I mean, no band gets to do anymore. But we got to literally travel the world without anything. All we had was a demo in our back pocket. And one thing that I learned was, and, and it, it helped, I, I, I do speak French, and we went to south of France. And we, I mean, we just went all over Belgium, and you name it, and we went to it. And the coolest thing that I learned was how much music actually unites people instead of divides people. So I found that in the environment of having to do music, even though I was a black man fronting this rock band, it was never an issue because music was the center. Music was literally the key of this. And because we could go to Germany and do a show, and people didn't speak English. And regardless of the color of our skin, they still enjoyed the concept of music. So I always found it as, a, 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 as trite as it might sound, as this great healer and not a divider. So I didn't really experience any of that because I was under the umbrella of music my whole life. You know, you talk about struggles and, and then you get your rewards afterwards. But the, the, one of the questions I have is, like, you, it took you a while to get you up and running on your boondocks films. 
you could have really went into another um, a film company and and work for them and kind of um, you know set your your own path. But here you did this from scratch, and it took a while for you to get up and running where you're in demand as you are now. How what what was that time period and uh, was there any kind of doubts that you had going forward? Well, there was there was definitely doubts because at the end, towards the end, we you know we then shifted our energy and we went to a new label and we then signed by Clive Davis and it was you know it's a life changing experience when you sit in a fancy office in front of Clive Davis who says hey I love you guys and it's a very cool feeling that you never forget but but once the band ended and the music kind of died and I was doing a lot of producing at the time we were making records and that was going well and I was making a good living doing it but I've always loved film it's what I actually studied because I thought I could study film and get something out of it as opposed to studying music which I was already doing because I started I think when I was my first gigs I was getting paid by the time I was 14 or 15 in clubs so I didn't feel like I could learn anything I was learning on the job training but with film was a very different story and and it's kind of it's kind of funny what inspired me to become a director was we had to the band shot a music video and I won't name any names but I will tell a little funny story that we shot this music video and in the middle of, you know, usually how it works when you shoot videos, the singers have to do more than the band because the singers have to, you know, sing on camera. So I'm sitting in the makeup chair. It's got to be four in the morning, you know, very nervous and butterflies in my stomach. And the door, the door opens and my trailer opens and I hear this crash. And I look behind me and it's the director who's pissed drunk. And he's literally fell on his face and had now had blood coming out coming out of his nose and he reached up his hand British guy and he reached up his hand and he said hello mate and so I sh- looked down at him on the ground shook his hand and helped him up bleeding from his nose and he just looked at me and said oh it's going to be a great day today it's going to be great it's, it's going to be great and we, I could smell the booze and I was like oh boy we're in trouble he walked out and that was the introduction to him and then the rest of the day it appeared to me he just had a hangover and at one point he left the set and I walked in and I started talking to the guitar player and telling the camera crew and the people what I wanted because he was gone. And that was sort of the spark that kind of started the, the first fire for me of loving to do, to kind of be in charge. And I feel like I then became a director because it was just a different way of telling stories. I was telling stories through songs, but I also realized very early on, and there was a little lesson that I had learned when I was at the label. We were recording one day, and we at the time the big thing were ADATs. So ADATs were like a did you look like a digital VCR? And so we asked the label, "Hey, listen, Wayne is doing a lot of recording right now, and we're not doing it on the reel to reel. We're not doing it on Pro Tools, but we're using these ADATs. Can you buy us one?" And I can't remember, I think, let's say, that for, for argument's sake, let's say it cost 1500 bucks to buy one back then. Well, the label said, no, we're not going to buy it for you. But what we will do is we'll rent it. And I remember thinking, okay, I don't know the difference. Very great. So by the time they were done renting it, it ended up costing $3,000 for them to rent it. So they wouldn't pay 1500 bucks to buy it, but they paid $3,000 to rent it. And I just remember that little life lesson. So later on, it always became a big deal for me for ownership of things. It was like the biggest lesson I had learned, like, oh, maybe it's better for me to own it than to ever borrow it or rent it. And so when I had this idea of saying, okay, I'm leaving New York City, and then I had a small stint with another band, I would started this other band called Head Rush, and we did an album, and we got a record deal. And then right on the, right on the cusp of the album coming out and shooting a music video, the label itself folded. So it kind of took the wind out of the sails, and it, it pushed me even more into fulfilling another dream of mine, of starting film and so I just decided to go big or go home and I built my own film studio and started my own film company right from day one so that's how it kind of forced me into just getting past the fear and just trying to do it initially you were doing um, videos and uh, just small film yeah I started I, I, I had started doing a music video and it was the you know the hardest thing this, this sounds crazy to me when I think about it, but when I, I woke up one day, I had this weird habit of kind of waking up and then making a new decision that I need to follow through for my entire life. I've just been doing that all the time. 
uh, without any fear, or, or with very little fear, but with always with execution. So I just woke up one day, and my my friend Scott Scott Berlane, who's now doing really well as a as a local um, uh, concert promoter, and he was sort of this kid on the scene that was helping us, sort of like a little little handler manager guy. I woke up one day and I said, Scott, I want to shoot a music video. Help me find a band. I want to be a director now full time. And he said, oh, okay. And I never realized how hard that was because I didn't have a, I had plenty of music to prove was, but I had nothing visual to, to, as for a reel to prove that I could direct. And it ended up taking about six months. I'm talking about we were putting ads saying, we'll shoot it for free. And we still couldn't get anyone. So finally one day he was doing some promotion and he found this band and said, hey, I think they've got 200 bucks and they want you, they'll allow you to shoot the music video. And it was like the greatest keys to the kingdom at that point to just go in and then do it for real. And it felt, I still remember that feeling of saying action and how it, and how good it felt. So that's, so, so we, so then I set a goal of saying, okay, I want to shoot three music videos and do two short films and then I'll build this film studio and just kind of do my whole LA thing. And I ended up doing, I can't remember, like 15 music videos and four shorts or something like that. And doing a bunch of commercials and PSAs and stuff. And then built my, my little field of dreams. Yeah, I mean, you're totally in demand now. We're going to go through all those. You have four movies and that we want to talk about. But just mm-hmm. recently you were asked to, or you had a meeting, I guess, with the Tupac family. To work on. The, oh on yeah, them. so I, I, I did. Yeah, you, you had told me about it, and I said definitely do it. It's the kids will be looking at it forever. So uh, someone else obviously took on that project, but did you ever get a chance to take a look at that movie? I did. Well, at the time, at the time when they first were talking about doing the whole Tupac thing, I had been approached to write the script itself for the movie. And then it became a, an interest in, like, do you have any interest in directing it? And, and I am a Tupac fan, and I did want to do it, but it just didn't come to be at that time. It was just too many too many cooks in the kitchen. And, and then years, then, then the project fell apart entirely, and I think it was because of Sugar Knight or something. They got to use it for all the buckets of Sugar Knight uh, at some point, and then it had to get revisited all together. I mean, I think that movie ro- rose and collapsed and rose and collapsed quite a few times. You know, uh, you can always blame Suge Knight for everything. It always works. I think so. A lot of people did not like that movie. And um, personally, I liked it. And I felt that uh, what was the difference between that and the Biggie movie is that it made him a real person. It showed his flaws. I think the Biggie movie, while Notorious was a good movie, it made him seem like, I mean, he's just a young guy. And it made him sound like he was kind of superhuman with his thought patterns of, you know, seeing, doing the right thing and, uh, you know... Um, Tupac was just a, a young guy, and he uh, made some bad decisions and some good decisions. And right. even faced with you know where he should go, he he went the wrong direction. Uh, right. But that's a that's a human story to me, and I I respect that movie more for for not taking on that superhero quality that that could have went that way. Now his right. his music, I mean, I, I think on Rotten Tomatoes, he's like it's like a fifty three. So um, a lot of people, I think, walked away disappointed. But as a, a piece of film, I felt it was done really well. I, you know, it's funny. I did, too, because I actually liked both of those movies. And I thought that the actor that they cast to play Tupac was just um, incredible, really. I, I, you, there were times at certain angles where you just thought it was Tupac. But, I, but the, the, you know, there's so many factors in it. The, what I equate is this, that what I've learned over the years is that filmmaking is simply two things for me. It's very simple. It's one, the rule number one is it's trying to tell a story. And rule number two is just trying to deal with all the crap it takes to tell that story. Mm-hmm. That's it. It's that simple. And I know they can write books on it, but I think I just nailed it down to two sentences. Wow. <laughs> to two simple sentences. So we don't know what circumstances they were under to make that film or the producers or the writers or the this and the that and all that stuff. I did actually enjoy it myself, but I tend to, I also tend to really, like movies and music are have always been a solace and a getaway for me. So even if a movie, not that that movie I did like, but even ones that I don't like, I still enjoy because it, it took me out of my own thought process and out of my world for like I'm a true movie goer I'm, I'm a target audience 
even though I'm a director and I should be more critical, I'm, I'm really not. I'm, I'm the target audience you want is someone that just wants to get popcorn and have fun. Why are your arm forearms so big and shiny on your pictures? <laughs> Do, well, do you polish questions. them up? You always like um, fold your arms, and these forearms look like big boulders, and they're always shiny and glossy. <laughs> well, I guess I can only equate it to two things: genetics and lotion. There you go. Uh, there you go. It seems to be one of your your staple moves now. I'm I'm watching. <laughs> oh, see, I, I was unaware of that, but that's pretty funny. I think I text. I I typed in. I said, "What's up with these forearms?" Uh, <laughs> You know, just to veer off and make a prediction, we're close to the you know, the Oscar time period. Is there anything out there that you saw that's nominated that you, you're you totally in love with? Um, I just saw last night Molly's Game, and I thought it was absolutely mind-blowingly fantastic. Is that your favorite at this point? I would say that that was my favorite. Um, Gary, well, my two favorite actors in the world are Gary Oldman and Sam Rockwell. Those are my two favorites. And both films that they were in, the Three Billboards one and Darkest Hour, next level fantastic. Yeah, you can't go wrong with a Gary Oldman film. You really can't. You can't go wrong with the big G, and I've been following him for half my life. And he's he is someone I would... And, and I love the fact that now, even in, as he's older and, and matured and all this, that he's getting the accolades he deserves now. Yeah, and I think he's able to drift even deeper into the roles because uh, he's lost his little baby face, and I feel his face is more available to, you know, take on different personas. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he's so just, that too. If it was my vote, that's who I would be voting for. I would I would say for for Chastain for Molly's Game, and I would say Gary for Darkest Hour because those two performances and they're bar none. I mean, I can't believe that was Sorkin's first movie, but that was just fantastic. Both of them fantastic. You know, uh, Baltimore only has one art film uh, location, and uh, it's a little tough to get down there. I didn't see most of the things that were nominated. I did see Get Out, and I saw it twice in the movie theater, and I thought it was great. I, I liked the whole social commentary. And it was a, I mean, I, I think it cost $20 million and it made, you know, $150 million. So yeah, I think it costs like five million. Uh, I think you're right. Million. Yeah, yeah I think Neil is definitely killing it right now. Yeah. So and and it was it was a, a really smart and and very dark, and uh, uh, it's just a sign of the times of where we're at right now. I, I actually think that omitting it and not uh, and denying it for how great it is is not right. And I I don't know. I I just feel like it needs to be appreciated somewhere. Well, I mean. At the end of at the end of the day, the, here, here's the irony: it it will it is appreciated by money because lots of people want to see it, and it it's considered a blockbuster by the ratio of what it cost to what it made. And it's you know if people don't win, they're still getting nominated. Everyone certainly knows that. But what you're trying to do with movies as best you can is very hard to do. Just have people know them. Certainly, everybody knows that film, so I I consider that a thumbs up win all around. Yeah, I agree. And I'm sure if they don't win anything, it doesn't mean anything. People are going to watch that movie forever. We're going to uh, talk about, now you did so much stuff in, in uh, 2017. Things are coming out. Things are in post-production. Um, let's talk about each one that you're working on or you've worked on. Uh, My Daddy's in Heaven is, you have the writer and director credit on this. Yeah, so I'm. So it, it's a pretty cool project that I became a part of. I was I was one of the writers. Uh, My Daddy's in Heaven. It's a it's a family Christian film, and it stars Corbin Burnson and Jen Gotson. And it's basically it's based on a book, a true story, a very sad story about uh, a woman who lives on a farm and she's just kind of trying to keep her family together. And her and the the, the, the father gets into a tragic accident. It's actually in real life he got into an ATV accident and during the ambulance drive home the intubation was wrong and the ambulance worker in the end is what killed him. So she decides to sort of pack up everything and go to the big city and try to find a new life for her. And it was one of the most rewarding experiences I'd ever have 
as a filmmaker because we had to do it in a relatively small amount of time, but we had a lot of locations and going to farms and it was just, and it was, and it was also one of these um, experiences where one of the things I love about making films, I, I love dealing, <laughs> I love dealing as, as, I'll, as I'll call it with that because you have to, maybe it's because I'm an only child and I didn't have any brothers or sisters, but there's this adoptive family that kind of comes around you and you have to be the dad to lots and lots of people. And you have to figure out what I suppose like a parent would, what everyone's individual needs are. Because it, it, in the most simplest of terms, a director's only job is to have an opinion. That's really the only job of a director. Should it be a green dress or a red dress? Red. Should it be this tall or this small? Small. Should it be this blue car or this purple car? Purple. That's really the biggest job that a, that a director has more than anything. People need answers. They're just running around, and they need direction. And you just tell them, and they want to execute and make you happy. But I think one of the fun times was dealing with some of these actors, because Jen Gottson, she's done a lot of stuff. And in many ways, she's sort of the, the Jennifer Aniston of, of Christian films. And she's done some big stuff, Frost Nixon, and a bunch of God is Not Dead, and some really cool films. But she really connected with me as a director where – Sometimes when you work with an actor, what they want to do is they want to just impress you and do their own thing. And in other times, like my case with her being the lead of the film, where she was truly dependent on every moment, emotional beat, every sentence, every breath, had to come from a connection with her director to be sure at all times that we were in, the, in, in, in step together. Everything was working in tandem. So it was really a fun experience because I would feel guilty even if I had to go to the bathroom because I needed to be there for every moment of it. I mean, you know, like, so it was, it was very different than, say, working with Ray Liotta. So when I'm on my, my first film, I did a film called Devils in the Details, and working with Ray was, was great and hell at the same time. I mean, he's one of these actors that I idolized growing up, and certainly everybody in, in the, on the planet has seen and loved Goodfellas. So I never imagined when I was a kid watching Goodfellas, be like, oh, the star of this movie, I'll, I'll get to work with him someday and, and making movies. I, none of these things would make any sense in my lexicon of life. But what was interesting with him is his independence from everything, his independence from, I mean, from, I might be choosing polite words, but his independence from everything makes it a different kind of challenge of saying, okay, well, I've got this pit bull that can bite you at any time, and i got to figure out how to make them dance and jump and jump through hoops and eat and sleep when I tell them to, as opposed to working with another actor that where they can say, direct me every minute of the day and, and, and tell you. And one of the most interesting things is that it's called basically end result directing. So one of the things that you can't do, and most people don't know this, but one of the things you, you try not to do as a director is not just to tell an actor, for example, do it faster. Because when you think about it, how does an actor act faster? They, does that mean they speak faster? Does that mean they walk faster? Does it mean they suddenly look like a silent 20s film? So that would be kind of an end result. Instead, for example, I could tell you, come in more anxious. And that's another way of telling you that we might pick up the pace a little bit without saying, go faster. And I remember one time, the whole time of working with Leota, they were just doing this scene in an office, and it was slow. And we're running out of time, we're running out of light. you know, everything is time and money, time and money, time and money. So I just ran in the room really quickly and I couldn't be in the room, the set was too small, so I was outside watching on the monitors, headphones on. I said, like, okay, we gotta pick up this pace. So I walked in and I said, uh, I said, hey, you know, this is a little bit slow, we gotta, we gotta pick up the pace. And without missing a beat, he just yelled out, why are you giving us the up and end result? Tell us how to get there. And, it just kind of made everybody quiet and everybody's done. So to to me, I still love every second of that because I've been very fortunate in my in my lifetime, even if I'm not the world's most famous person, I've been very fortunate to, to have signed three record deals and four movie deals in my lifetime. And I, and I feel very accomplished for that while I have more ambitions to do more and to grow. And I'm very humbled by it because I, I believe doing all of this is a privilege. It's not a right, but it's a privilege. And every time I do a project or a film, I always tell that to the crew. Just remember one thing, that it's a privilege to be here. No one, no one was given some kind of divine right to be here. Mm -hmm. When is my dad, is my daddy's in heaven out yet? So that's going to be, I just got word yesterday that that's going to be out, I believe, March or April. Okay. And uh, is that wide release or is that, I know Christian uh, 
uh, media sometimes have different uh, channels that they they uh, promote their their products. They do, and it's all it's all very different, and it's also part of it that I'm actually learning as I go along. So I'm not sure on that yet because I just literally got heard this last night. So they're weird to see what channel. I mean, they, the Christian movies do it, and I mean, sometimes they will just screen stuff at churches themselves. Like it's a, it's a. I had never been a part of something where you have to do a prayer before you start. It was just something so incredibly kind, and the only, I guess the only word I could use is like class, because there was no ego whatsoever. It was. I think the only ego came out of the acting itself, but not the doing. That's mm-hmm. that's the only part. Like. Working with Corbin Burnson was great. I mean, he's certainly a seasoned actor that's done a ton. He he had no problem standing up to me and challenging challenging me on certain days about wanting to do things when I wanted him to do it a different way, and he would say, no, let's do it this way. And Usually I always had a very strong diplomatic approach to just getting my own way, I guess. <laughs> but it was, but it, I'd never done something like that on that scale in that genre, and I definitely would love to do more of them because it was just a beautiful experience. I can't say anything negative. Now, your next uh, production is was actually a TV show called Falling from Angels. That's a TV show, and you have yes. a director and writing credits uh, for that one. Uh, yeah. Where is this played? What's the, what's the theme of this show? So what was interesting about that is, yeah, the, the series is called Falling for Angels, and I had, went from the Here TV network, and I had met with the executives, and they were trying to hire a bunch of different directors to tell a bunch of different stories of areas in Los Angeles. And it was a great, another, another really cool experience where they just said, look, go write a story, tell the story you think that you can tell best, and... To, every, to each one of the directors to have your own backdrop. So mine was an area called Lamert Park. Uh, and other areas were Bel Air, uh, Koreatown. So it really was giving like a diverse view of all of Los Angeles. And so it became this, and I mean, it was tough for the crew because the crew had to shoot this series of the same crew, but then they just had to take on a different director basically each week that come, came in to do it. And everybody had their own different styles and different approaches. So it was another really fun, I mean, I tend to say at the end that a lot of the experiences were good as opposed to bad, because as the leader, I have to set the tone. Mm -hmm. And I I genuinely love doing it, so I don't come in with a lot of attitude as opposed to lots of ideas. And Because the best idea wins, you have to be diplomatic and all that stuff while still seeing your own vision. But I never had any, I never really had many problems with trying to deal with crew and people and personnel. It's just that's something that's where my skills lie best i think you should tell uh, the president that <laughs> the, <laughs> the uh one that you're really excited about that's still in production you you have writer uh director and editing credits on this one is aberration oh apparition yeah aberration? So just, am i saying it right i went out to this very cool um I, it's a school, but I always refer to it as a castle because it's this massive castle in Ione, California, called Preston School of Industry. And the unfortunate part about Preston in real life is that back in the day, kids, when when kids were delinquents, let's say in the late 1800s, I think that's when they built the school, kids actually, you could be 11 years old, and when you did something bad, you went to San Quentin, or you you actually, <laughs> you know, you went to Alcatraz. They didn't have some place to put you. So they built this school in order to put all the troubled kids in and not be with the 30-year-old convicts that killed seven people. Of course, then as time went on, it created its own problems because it created a new corrupt system that was off the grid. And in real life, there was a woman there. Her name was Anna Anna Corbin. And she was the housekeeper and, I, and basically like the mother. They considered her to be the mother of the kids. And one day they found her dead in one of the rooms near the pool, wrapped up in a carpet, and became this big murder mystery for many, many years. They never really solved to this day. And that became sort of a little bit of the basis of the facts of this horror film, because in ours, that's, it's a more modern, modernized version of that. And at some point, the kids come back, and it becomes all the kids that were killed there. It's a, it becomes a sort of like a ghostly revenge tale. Hmm. And it stars Kevin Pollack, who was someone I wanted desperately to meet and to work with, and Mina Suvari, which most people would know from American Pie or as being the, 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 the girl of 
admiration and American beauty. And it was a trip because, you, you know, they, they always tell you in filmmaking to the hardest thing is to work with kids and animals. So I still have not worked with animals yet, but every project seems to have kids. And it's a, and it's a trip because you have to figure out how to shoot in a very limited amount of windows. You know, a typical day is something you could be on set for 12, 15 hours, but the kid has to come in and be gone in three. <laughs> and then in the middle of working with them, they've got to go to class. you got to set up a school in the middle of your set. I don't know how they do shows like Modern Family, and I just don't know how they work out this kind of system. So it is very, very challenging and problematic. I did work, luckily work with a really, really cool group of kids who were just so gung-ho to, 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 you know, to make me happy and get the best out of it. And then working with Pollock was a bit of a, a dream come true because I've been always been a huge fan of his stand-up and then a big, you know, A Few Good Men and The Usual Suspects. These are classic films. So I thought, well, I think one of the coolest memories that I have, and I, and I always look at making these things as just a, another way of creating memories. But one of my funnest memories was, fondest memories was him being on set and he just started telling a story about working on Usual Suspects. And just, just randomly, because actors have a lot of time between takes when you're setting up stuff. I mean, one of the coolest things about working with Leota was he told me, uh, you know, he pulled me aside and started telling me a story about Scorsese, and he started telling me a story about working with, with Ridley Scott and on Hannibal. And I, mean, I just thought, Jesus, this is, this is one of the, it's just one of the coolest things on earth, one of the coolest jobs ever, is, but there's much stress that comes with it. Still getting to interact with all of these these actors on this caliber is just a fun time for me and something that I really respect and appreciate. But Kevin in particular, he just he gave me his all and he was just nothing but a class act. When is the release date on this? So the release date on that, I'm not sure because that's now in the throes of post. We're hoping to get that done by the beginning of March. So either end of year or beginning of next year, most you know realistically, most most likely. And then kind of what was interesting, too, was in between all that, I then had to shoot a documentary. I shot a documentary a few years ago called The Abundance Factor. And that was a really fun film because basically there was this kid uh, named Riley Day. And I guess at the time he was about 20, 21 years old. And the kid went to sleep on the second story. He lives in Canada, went to sleep, woke up in the hospital. And it turns out in the middle of the night he sleepwalked and fell off the balcony, landed on his head. And he survived it and then decided to go on this journey to find out what life was really about. So we ended up traveling all over the world from here to, from L.A. to Malaysia, filming some of the top sort of entrepreneurs in the, you know, the kind of Tony Robbins type of people. And then we ended up, uh, it was so successful that we had to shoot a follow-up called Age of the Entrepreneur. And I know that we had to stop because of my other film in the middle of it, but we're going to be meeting with people like uh, Wozniak and... Uh, Richard Branson, and so it's another fun, a fun experience. I mean, this, this, I could have never imagined as much travel being a director as I did being on the road as a musician. I, I never imagined that that was even possible, but somehow it kind of kept happening. I do love hotels, so I guess it's not a bad thing. Well, yeah, you had some uh, experience where other people would be like, be uh, exhausted by that whole process. <laughs> that's, that's true. Yeah, and that's why. That's why, you know, and I guess that's why I have the energy and the love for it so much. There are days, I won't lie, of course, where it's like you don't know your ass and your elbow just trying to stay above water to keep your thoughts clear. Because I, But I, I feel like being the lead singer in a rock band was almost the same training of being a director on a film set. Because it's still having to be the main guy in charge, the main one people are looking at, and the main person that has to kind of deliver the message of whatever it is. You're American kickboxer that's in production. You're doing cinematography where you're doing director and editing too. Cinematography, are you just behind the camera? Yeah, that was a behind the camera thing. It was a TV show they're developing that was sort of like a, not quite a UFC, but sort of a UFC approach to a, a new genre because now that they're adding kickboxing to the Olympics, that it's like sort of following some of these candidates and some of these, these kids that are doing it. And Eric Roberts was who is another person that I was really excited to work with and, and meet ever since um, uh, the book of Greenwich Village, which is on my like top five list of favorite movies ever. So, so it's so interesting. Um, and then finding everyone's like 
I guess everyone's different work method because Eric tends to now, he doesn't like memorizing lines so much. He just likes to write stuff down. So you have to have cue cards and stuff and they have to be the right size and they have to, and he's a very sweet, very kind man. But what was, you know, it's fun to go, okay, well that's his process, which is completely different than I worked with another actor named Raymond J. Barry, which some people would probably recognize from, he was one of the three wise men in training day and he was one of the bad guys in the purge too. And, and, and when I asked him, he had to show up on set one day to do a monologue, and I said, how in the world did you, do you, remem- do you memorize all of this without ever making a mistake? Every time I said action, he never made a mistake. Said it exact- and he said that his process was that he has to say a monologue a hundred times in a row without ever making a mistake. Once he does it one, and he counts it, once he does it 100 times, then he's prepared to go in front of the camera. So I just thought, okay, well, that's an interesting, and that's part of the thing. I mean, I don't get to do it very often, but I do, But when I do, I enjoy doing it. Like, I, I also teach a class, an acting class, and it's called Studio A Acting Class. And so it's where I just get some students together, some people, and I teach them everything that I know because I feel like I get to work with more and more actors on set, more and more people, and it's a fun way to give, and they, the students learn a ton. And I love doing it when I have the free time to do it. I think that's fantastic. When's the last time that you did acting teaching, the Studio A? I did it. I managed to squeeze it in. I know I'm going to try to do it again this coming, like, mid-February. Um, but I did it about, the last time I was able to do it was over a year ago. It was, I think, before we did the uh, Daddy's in Heaven film. I kind of do a little six-week class. So I'm going to try, I'm trying to, to set one up again to do one in mid-February. So, if, I don't know, if there are any actors in the Los Angeles area, then just studio acting class. StudioAActingClass.com. There are no actors in L.A. right now, unfortunately. (laughs) (laughs) Wayman Boone, thank you very much for spending some time with us at Something Came from Baltimore. Hey, nothing but a pleasure. I love your show, and thank you for having me be a part of it. Something came from Baltimore tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. Something came from Baltimore tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. Something came from Baltimore 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 tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. Something came from Baltimore.